Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. But a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young man rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young man came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of their priests became obedient to the faith. God say amen. Now, by the way, the background, again, the book of Acts is a uh, record. It is the powerful declaration of the early church's uh, efforts to uh, take the words of Jesus and to go to all the world and proclaim the good news of Jesus. To go and make disciples to go and embed this revolutionary way of living, of following the ways of Christ into every culture, every people group that they may encounter. Now what is fascinating about the book of Acts, as we have said many uh, times before, is that it is a continuation of the book of Luke. Luke. Amen. We don't be Bible students out in the wild, praise God. Man, maybe after the whole summer we'll all know the answer to that. Amen. It is a Luke part two. It is written by uh, the same individual who wrote the gospel according to Luke. And it is attempting to tell a very excellent account and story of what does it mean for people to hear the words of God, hear the words of Jesus, and actually take them and make them their own. Now, when we come to these passages of Scripture, I think it's important to understand a couple of things, particularly in church, and they are indeed participating in the life of the church. But what we have not read in Acts chapter 4 is this unified commitment that they all made to bring everything that they had and to lay it at the apostles' feet so it can be redistributed to everyone in the church. So as the text said, no one was in need. It was a commitment that they but by those 
they were, uh, uh, you know, kind of participating in, unbeknown to everyone else. And, and, and what was so amazing about uh, the, the life of the early church was these folk were in such covenant with one another that they uh, expected each other not only just to share, but to be honest and to have integrity and to make sure that everything that they were doing was above board and was uh, a reflection of the work of God in their life. Ananias, the husband, the man of the household, the, the, the spiritual leader, really led his whole family into a very tragic confrontation with the church. And it reminds us that men, all of us who are men, we are responsible, spiritually, emotionally. We, or our uh, lack of leadership, or our profoundly, uh, you know, kind of con contradictory style of leadership with our family can either cause our lives to thrive, or we can find ourselves leading our family into a hole that you cannot recover. Ananias knew better. But Ananias thought that he could scheme God, scheme the church, and by his dishonesty, the scripture says, brought death into his house. Now I want you to bracket Ananias for a second. Let's go over to Chapter number six. You have a group of uh, disciples who are growing, the scripture says, in great number. And their impact and the, the reputation of their integrity and their ministry uh, has become so powerful that they are now growing beyond their capacity. And the apostles who are now
or someone that does. Mm. First Corinthians chapter 12 says that when I was a child, All right. I fought like a child. Yeah. I acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Yeah. How many of you know that being a man, uh, an adult, being mature, has nothing to do with your age? <laughs> Because we got a lot of older folk who still feel like a child, act like a child, and show ain't putting away child to sin. When you follow the ways of Jesus, you can't help but grow up. Because you begin to realize that life is too serious to be playing that we have been called to handle. There are responsibilities that we have been called to step into. And what is at stake, literally, as we see in this story, is either a pathway of death that we lead our families into, Ananias, or a pathway of life that we bring our families into. These few good men I'll call. And child of God, I want us to be a church that is a pipeline for a few good men. I want us to be men who are able to always be plucked out of the crowds. Wherever you may be, as someone who is full of spirit and wisdom. Someone that people always know on your job and you need a good man.
our Santa Rita. Some of us are in jail in our mind. Some of us are in jail in our soul. In our emotions. In our bodies. We are in jail. And we know we're in jail because we have been trying everything we can to break out of that thing that has us on lock and key. Being a disciple of Jesus is the singular pathway out of jail. How many know people can lock you up, but if you follow Jesus, you are not
that you uh, violate mm -hmm. the sacredness of that woman God gave you. If you are so frustrated before you get married with this woman, you should move along. Move along. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. If you're so frustrated while you are married, you better get some counsel yeah. and some help. Yeah. And if you still can't keep your hands off the sister, you need to move along too. Because being a husband is not about you being, I'm the king of the castle. And that's not scripture. That's right. You know, that's the world. That's why the world's all messed up. Yeah, I'm the king of my castle. Yeah. Bring me some water. Bring me, bring me that. I was watching, I was watching one of these comedy shows, and he had a bell. What was that comedy show? I can't remember what show that was. The guy had a bell, and it got so tough that, you know, they got a hammer and start banging the bell. Like, you gonna stop ringing this bell. Back in the with a bell. <clears throat> Being a husband means that, Scripture says that, husbands love your wife. As Christ loved the church, love says, love your wife as much as you love yourself. <clears throat> then it says, why submit to your husband? I know it's the 21st century, and that's just like, folks take that out for miles all together. <laughs> but I think women will willingly follow men who are leading them into life. Anyone will follow you if you lead them into life. I mean, anyone. It ain't just gender specific.
no just amount of coercion that can get her back on the right track without crushing her spirit. Because I had to get put back on the right track and I know my spirit ain't crushed. <laughs> My wheel got broke. <laughs> My dad told his sons, y'all like stallions. Running in the prayer. My job is to break your wheel. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens with this thing is that there is a, a, a certain balance that must be created when you're raising children. And as a father, if you have sons, you need to help them sons to understand the world they live in. You need to help your daughters to understand, in spite of what the world says about them, who they are. They're beautiful, they're strong, they're smart. Father, that's a unique role that we play. We, we don't play our roles, fathers. We are like Ananias, leaving our families into death. Your absence is still leadership. Your absence in your family as a father is still leadership. So you must make sure your leadership is full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So you can always be plucked out of the crowd to stand in is relegated to those who have physical uh, uh, children. But I, I'll, I'll add mentorship in here. All of us who are single, who don't have any you know, children yet, and even some of us who do got children, we're called to mentor. We got 70% of our kids are being raised in single parent homes. That means there's a lot of kids out here that need a male thing right. to step in. Right. Don't be so selfish that you think that you are abnegated from the responsibility to stand in the gap. Right. All of us should have a mentor mm -hmm. or a mentee. Mm -hmm. All of us. You should find you a young man in your life that you can mentor. Your church, in your neighborhood, pray for God that's in your family. Being a father is you bringing direction to those who have none. And the final thing, be a cycle breaker. Be a cycle breaker. And an artist started a cycle of death in this family. By lying, cheating, scheming. He's a part of the church community, lying, cheating, scheming, cycle of death, started in his family that took his whole family out the game. Yeah. This side you got, again, a few good men, beginning a cycle of integrity and responsibility. How many of you know that many of our communities are caught up in cycles of destruction? Cycles of irresponsible things. Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. You should write this down just in case you ever need to tell somebody, your homies, your friends, yourself. If you do not follow commandments, your sins will be visited to the third and fourth generation. Praise God. Now, I want you to understand that that is not a, a 
a, 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 a sentence, like a, you know, when a judge sentence guilty, 34 generations, that is not a declaration of God punishing you or me. It is God's observation and warning that if you and I do not bring cycles, praise God, they're called cycles for yes. a reason. They will repeat themselves over and over again. Isaiah 61 says that we shall be called oaks of righteousness, repairers of the breach, that you and I must view ourselves as men, fathers, husbands who will break sight. Many of our young sisters are chasing after men who are like their fathers. And it is important for you and I, men, to understand that the kind of fathers we will be may, it will influence our children. Their generations. Yeah. Oh, Pastor, that's a lot. That's some heavy stuff. It's meant to be heavy. Yeah. Amen. This ain't no light thing. Yeah. The role of men in our communities must be not only owned and embraced, but we must lean into that mm -hmm. and own that. Yeah. If we don't embrace cycles, these cycles will perpetuate themselves in very powerful and tragic ways. My dad used to tell us all these different kinds of truths growing up. How my mom and him grew up in families of abuse and addiction and all kinds of stuff. My dad told his sons, we have high, my dad told us, we have, we have high uh, predilection towards addictions. Yeah. So don't drink. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, once you get on that liquor, you won't get off. <laughs> yeah. So we listen to our dad. Because he put in us that there's something in our past that we don't even know about, that he decided to break. Amen. And if you break cycles, guess what? You get to start to do cycles. Amen. It's never too late to break cycles. It's never too early to start to cycles. Make a decision that you will be husbands and fathers, followers of Jesus. No matter where you are in your life, don't pass it off. Oh, it ain't too late. Why? Because you still got to be a mentor to somebody. It ain't too late because you still got grandkids, you still got sons, you still got daughters. So it's never too late to start a new way of living. It's never too late to make a decision. I'm not going to be the Ananias profile. I'm not going to be in that number with a few good men. Happy Father's Day. Amen. It is a happy day when we step into who God has called us to be. Stand with me, everyone.